Let's take another look at what the true gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. When I first got saved, delivered from drugs, knew the call of God was on my life since I was about seven years of age, and I got saved in an old tent meeting, didn't know what church to go to, Every one of them's different. Ever ever flavor is different. Each group has what they say is the truth. I didn't know wh who had the truth and who didn't have the truth and who to listen to and who not to listen to. So I just turned my heart to seek the Lord. And I earnestly prayed. And said, the Lord, your truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way, the only way. You can't come to the Father any other way except through Jesus Christ. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And you know what? Jesus Christ did not come into the world... To start another religion. But we have taken Jesus Christ. And we have made him another religion. Jesus is not a religion. You say what is religion? Let's just give an example. You take the Muslims. They have their Quran. They had their prophet Muhammad. Who lived... Hundreds of years ago. Thousands of years ago. And he came and lived this life. And he claimed to be such a perfect prophet. Until he wrote all of the words down. That he thought that everybody ought to live by. How he lived. And he passed it down and wrote it down in the Koran. A book. And left it for everybody else to live up to and live by. The Muslim today they still... Read and study the Koran, trying their best to live up to the teachings of Muhammad, and every one of them are interpreted indifferent. Some are radical, some say that, you know what, we ought to kill all the heathens. Others say, no, we don't kill all the heathens, we convert them to Islam. And so there's radical groups in it. But we as Christians, have taken Jesus Christ and made him our prophet. And he was a prophet. But we have taken him and made it look like through our teachings that Jesus Christ came, he lived a perfect life, he told us a bunch of stuff to live by, and he left it in a book, and now we're supposed to read and study the book and try to live up to that book. Same thing. Religion. That is not the truth. It's not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. He did not come as a prophet only, and he did not come and teach us all these good teachings, and then Paul came along and added some more good teachings, and now we have the book, and now we're all trying to live up to the book. The definition of religion is all of us doing good, living right, living up as much as we possibly can to the book of the Bible. And if we can live up to it and please God and please deity, then we'll gain his favor and then we'll get his blessing. Does that sound familiar in church teachings today? But it's not the gospel. That's not the truth. Not what the word teaches. Not what Jesus taught. He did not come into the world to give us laws and ordinances and regulations. We think and we teach in churches, and believe you me, I pastored for years, 28 years or so. And I'm talking from Ron Thomas and what I taught and what I preached. You know why I preached that? Because I was preached that from the time I was under the church bench on a pallet. Until about five years ago, 
God started just unveiling, peeling the onion skins off so I could see the truth. Because you know what religion does? It'll wear your butt out. Excuse me, it'll wear you out. <laughs> do, do, do. That's all it is. Do, do. <laughs> you know what it does? We in church that is taught church entity and taught religion are actually taught to live a good life, live a good moral life, do good, go to church, read your Bible, study, pray, give in the offerings. That'll make you spiritual. Makes you about as spiritual as a donkey. You can teach the dog tricks. We heard on America's Funny Videos we watched the other night. And these dogs, these people had actually taught them to, to sing and to speak. I love you. <laughs> I told Barbara when he got through, I said, he's still a dog. <laughs> Churches teach us to be like Jesus. Live like Jesus. Try to be like Christ. You're a failure when you start. You'll never be able to live up and be like Jesus. Like Dandy said. That's not the teachings. Jesus didn't tell us to be like him. Somebody came up to Jesus and said, Good master, hold it right there. There's nobody good. I'm not good. There's only one good, and that's the Father. He lives on the inside of me. If there's any goodness you see, it's not I, but it's the Father's goodness that's living his life through me. We have this treasure in earthen vessels full of flaws. Most of us are crack pots. Clay pots is cracked. Just don't let anybody see any humanity in you, brother. you got to live up to the only problem with that is, what code are we going to live up to? Every church has its own code. Every group has their regulation and their ordinances. Some churches you go to, if you're not up there doing this during praise and worship, you are dead. Other people, if you do this in praise and worship, you're out of order. Other people, if you, wear, if you don't have long hair, you're unholy. Other people think if you got long hair, then you're religious. God is not in the, in the process of measuring hair. Well, it's what you eat and what you don't eat. It's what you do or you don't do. This is taught rampant in our groups of churches. I was one that preached it hard. But you know what? If you'll read the Bible and you'll see the teachings of Jesus and you'll live up to all the stuff he taught us to live up to. Live a good life. Live a holy life. And quit doing all them things you're doing wrong. Rots a rook with that one. Who can quit doing all things that's wrong to do? I'm six years old. 67 years old. I've never met, and I was raised under the church bench. My daddy was a preacher for 64 years before he went on to be with the Lord, pastor most of those years. But you know what? Living up or trying not to do all the stuff that the Bible says you're not supposed to do, I've never met one person yet that's ever accomplished that. Never. I've seen some that thought they had and they were real self-righteous. Look down on all of us because they could see what all we hadn't got perfected yet. What all was wrong with you? Isn't it amazing how people living by that 
doing good and trying not to do bad. You know where that came from? The devil. Yes. Oh, <laughs> well, go back and read your Bible. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 2, where God put in the garden two trees. One was the tree of life. You could partake of that tree and eat the fruit of it, and you had eternal life simply by just eating the fruit of the tree. Come on now. You had eternal life. You would live with the life of God forever simply because, are you listening? You ate some fruit that had some seed in it and it gave you the life of God. That's all it took. And then you had this other tree that was in the garden and it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's the tree where you do good and you shun the evil and Satan said you'll be like God if you'll do that. Do the right Shun the wrong and do the right. Remember that song we used to sing? I know the Lord will make a way for me. If I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord, he'll make a way for me because I'm holy now. (laughs) I'm sorry, but that's not. God does not make a way for me because I live a holy life. There's nothing holy about me except the one that is holy and righteous living on the inside of me. It's his nature. It's his desires. It's in me that we yield ourselves. It's no longer I that liveth, but it's Christ who lives his life through me. Praise God for the day. That God brought me to the end of trying to live a Christian life and teaching everybody else how to live a Christian life. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Wait a minute. It's not I that's really doing the living. It's him on his side. He's living it through me. Well, that takes the pressure off, don't it? I've shared this before. I'm telling you, you talking about a walking devil, you're looking at one. Used to be one. Before I got saved, I'm telling you, I was dangerous because I didn't care if I lived or died. You didn't scare me with no gun. Make my day. Only thing you had to do is call me a red-headed peck of wood and I'd knock your block off. <laughs> Back then I was red-headed. And I had hair. <laughs> now what was my point? <laughs> you know what? I got to the place where I was totally, completely bound by drugs, consumed with drugs. I lived every day to see my next meal, my next pill. That was first and foremost. I lived every day by the lust of the flesh. I lived every day. Married and had two kids when I was 30 years of age. I was never faithful to my wife. Never. I mean, from three months after we got saved, I was never faithful. Not bragging. I'm just telling you what was going on in my life at the time. I lived by a spirit of lust. A lust that consumed my life. And that lust drove me, controlled me, dominated me. It dominated my thought life. It dominated my dress. It dominated how I fixed my hair. It dominated how I polished my shoes. It dominated every area of my life. I 
three months after I got married, my wife could not Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> Wasn't after I got saved. <laughs> it was after I got married. <laughs> Need to clarify that. Thank God for that. <laughs> See, God does speak to me through my wife. <laughs> and the reason I'm going here is my wife and I, marriage on the rocks, no feelings anymore, too much water under the bridge, too much hurt, too much pain, on drugs every day. And I started a relationship with a, I was 30, with a 20-year-old that had a little boy two years old. Going to get a divorce and marry the younger one, get rid of the old one, get the young one. Because she made me feel so young. I'm going somewhere. Hold on. But you know what? My wife was going to get her divorce. She was filing for divorce. She was the one that was going to do it. And the Lord spoke to my heart. You say, God don't talk to sinners. Oh, yes, he does. The Lord spoke to my heart and he said, if you get a divorce, if you allow her to get a divorce, you're losing the only stable thing in your whole life because she was a Christian, gave her life to the Lord about a year earlier. You will absolutely go off the deep end. Then Satan started talking to me. How does Satan talk to you? No, I don't hear voices. Satan talks by giving you thoughts and reasonings and feelings. And he does that through your soul, your mind, your emotions, and your will. How Satan talks to us. Then all of a sudden, Rocky, the curtain pulled back. And I saw that I had a wife that loved me with all of her heart. Prayed for me all the time. I'd come home cursing, high on drugs, kicking, mad. She sat there at the table. I'm talking about my first wife who passed away when she was 39. Thank God for my first wife now. This is my first wife now. She sat there and she just sat quietly. She just prayed for God to give me peace. She just said, Ron, it's going to be okay. God's going to work it out. Don't tell me that. You can't sit around and wait for God to work everything out. He don't do that. You got to work it yourself. And I'm drowned in here in debt and problems and bills, situations. And one time I came in, I was going to work and had a motorcycle and thing quit on me. Had to push it back to the house. I walked in the house and took my helmet. And I'm not proud of this. I'm just giving you a picture of who I was and what was going on. I pulled that helmet off when I walked in. And my kids and my wife was sitting at the kitchen table. And I threw that helmet right across the breakfast table. Slung food everywhere. My two girls just absolutely horrified. And then Satan started talking to me. Say, you know what? You ain't nothing but a sorry, low-down, good-for-nothing. You ain't a good daddy. You ain't a good husband. You ain't a good nothing. On drugs, messed your life up, messed your wife, family, or her life up, messed your kid's life up. You know what? They'd be better off if you were dead. Maybe they could, she'd find her a good husband. I knew I wasn't a good one. That's what you need to do. If you was out of the way, you got insurance, you could leave them a good sum of money. I was in trucking, had a life insurance policy. You could leave them a good amount of money. That set them up, and by that time, she could find her a good husband, one that would love her and treat her right. 
Be a dad to your kids that you ain't never been a dad to like you ought to be. He convinced me that I was so sorry and so low down that the only thing that would be good for me was to be dead. I agreed with him. I planned it. Going to be an accident. Some of you have heard this story many times. But before I came back around on that trip in order to make that accident look like an accident, I already seen it in my mind. I already planned the whole thing. Next time I came on this trip, which was once a month, I was going to end it with that accident. Before I got back around to that trip, God worked it out for me to go to an old tent meeting. To see my sister Carolyn. I sat there kind of critical. Bunch of religious nuts. All of them. This, that, and other. I ain't I had no desire to be like that bunch. Then the Lord led that minister. Back to this couple sitting on this side. And we, me and my wife, even though we was getting divorced, and my sister was sitting on this side, the minister came over here and told him, stand up, said, Satan's tried to destroy your marriage. He's been trying to destroy your life. But the Lord is going to heal your marriage today. And the Lord's going to get involved. And he's going to do a work. And y'all going to fall in love again with each other. That couple just raised a hand. I saw the joy of the Lord come back on their face. I saw tears pouring down their cheeks. They believed what God spoke through the man of God. The minister turned around and started back walking across that big old tent. Got about halfway across there and I broke. I said, God, I can't promise you I'll live right. I can't promise you I'll quit lusting. I can't promise you I'll get off of drugs. I can't promise you that I'll be anything but who I am. But God, if you can do for me, and my wife and my life, what you did for that couple, how that preacher, Lord, come back over here and have him to minister to me. And Ann, like, he, like you ministered to them, I know that was real. I hadn't even got that thought out of my mind. It was still there, and I was praying that to the Lord, only in my thoughts. And that preacher was walking this way, and he done just like this, and turned back and said, stand up. He said, God has had a call on your life from your mother's womb. God called you in your mother's womb. And Satan has done everything in his power to stop you. Just like Moses tried to destroy you. Just like David tried to kill you. But God has called you and chosen you and drawn you by his spirit. And God is going to heal your life today. Those yokes that are around your neck will be broken today and you will be a new person when you walk out of here today and nothing will ever be the same. God heals your life today. I threw my hands up, tears pouring down my cheeks. The Lord, it was like, you know what you do? You're so true. Okay, God, I yield. Okay, just be it unto me what you're saying. I knew I couldn't change my life. I just told God. I can't change my life. I can't quit lusting. I can't quit drugs. I can't quit this. I can't stop this. I can't turn around and make a marriage work because there ain't no marriage there. I don't promise you anything, God. But I need you to do something for me that I can't do for myself. When he turned around and started, the minister turned around and started walking off, I'm telling you, it was like I had a spiritual animal. All the crap was gone. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Dung. Bible calls it dung. We call it other things. Same stuff. God just, a new person. A new creature in Christ. Minister turned and started walking off, and the devil spoke to my mind just like that. 
You can't quit them drugs and you know it. You'll never get off of that and you'll never quit this and you'll never be able to do that. You know you can't. You done tried it and tried it and that reason you quit trying to live a Christian life. It spoke, all of a sudden, the joy just drained out of me just like that because Satan had told me you can't live it. No need in trying. You done tried it before. You failed every time. You're bound by habits and you're bound by things you'll never be able to quit doing and you know it. The minister turned around, walked back over there and had a handkerchief. He stuck that handkerchief in my pocket. He said, make up in your mind right now to give your life to the Lord and let God work out all that stuff that Satan trying to torment you with. Juicy preaching today, ain't it? Spitting. <laughs> See, we think we got to change this and we got to stop this and we got to do this and we got, you won't have to do anything except, okay, God, just as I am without one plea. But that your blood was shed for me. That's all it is. The Lord does the rest. Minister laid hands on my head. Bound those spirits that had me bound. Commanded those spirits to let me go free. Took authority over them spirits. Commanded them spirits to leave. And you know what? I felt that. I felt them spirits. What do you mean you felt the spirits? I'm telling you, when he got through doing that, I felt so weak, I just wanted to fall on the ground. Those spirits were gone. I felt so drained. But it was a good drain. God had emptied me out. Why does the Lord want to empty us out? So he can fill us up. <laughs> he empties all his stuff out so he can fill us up. It doesn't happen all at one time. He does a major thing one time and then the rest of our life he starts doing the rest of it without us having to do it. It's a process. You know what? <laughs> all of a sudden I realized whew, I enjoyed this part. I realized that it wasn't even me there was that slow, sorry, low down, good for nothing person back there. That was not Ron Thomas. I had a heart. I loved God. I would love to live right. But when I try to do good, evil is always present. When I try not to do bad, then I can't do good. And the Lord just spoke to my heart. He said, See, it wasn't you that was bad. It was the one that was bad that was living in you. Get him out. You're not that way at all now, are you? Jesus said that when the strong man keeps his house and protects his goods, he dominates that house because he lives in that house and he controls and dominates all that stuff that's in there that's his. But when there's a stronger man come and comes into that house and binds that strong man and take him and cast him out of the house, then the stronger one can spoil his goods and strip him out. Didn't say the house had to clean its own self out. Like church and religion teaches. You got to clean yourself up, man. No, you don't. Let the one that got the strong man out, let him clean it out. He's good at it. He's a good housekeeper. He's a good house cleaner. So, <laughs> Jesus said, the strong man that keeps his house intact and guards that house is Satan. But the strong one who is me 
with the authority of Almighty God, binds that man and casts him out of the house whose house we all are. And when the strong man is cast out, then Jesus cleanses us and washes us of all sins. Every one of them. Never to be remembered ever against you again. Never. Cast as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? There's no end to it. Keeps going the opposite direction. He cleans the house up. Now this is the key. Listen carefully. This is the key. This is what it takes. This is what we do. We receive Christ as our Savior. We ask him to cleanse us from our sin. Now we feel clean. Now he's, he's washed us in his blood. Now I'm free from sin because he's cleansed me from all sin. But Jesus said that the one that was cast out will come back to the house and he finds it clean and washed and garnished and cleared out of all the junk but he finds it empty. And Satan goes and gets seven more demons, worse than it was to start with, and come back into that house and takes control of the house again. I thought the stronger man had cast them out. What he's saying is, is don't just receive Jesus as your Savior. Don't just ask him to forgive you of your sins. Don't just say I'm a Christian now because all my sins are forgiven. No, invite the stronger one to come in and live on the inside of you. And when the stronger one lives in you, the lesser stronger cannot come back in and take it back over. Greater is he that now is within me than he that is in the world. He'll never get back in me again. Why? Because I got the strong man living on the inside. He's greater than any spirit, any power, any force. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ, the stronger one, living his life on the inside. When Satan comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Let's read a little scripture. John 3. Whew. I'm going to close in the next hour or two. John 3, 14. John 3, 14. Not going to take a long time on this. This is Jesus talking, talking to Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is he saying? Go back to the story of Moses. When Moses lifted up that brass serpent in the wilderness. What does that mean? Snakes was biting God's people. He was biting God's people. And they were killing them. Serpents was killing the people. But God went, I mean, Moses went and talked to God. God said, put a brass serpent. Put it up on a pole. And everybody that looks, they'll live and will not die. Jesus said the same one. Satan is out here seeking whom he may devour. He's trying his best to destroy lives. He does destroy lives. Let me ask you something. Would you work for a thief? that was always stealing your money and robbing you blind and doing everything under the, in, under the sun to try to make you a failure and to defeat you and discourage you to get you to the place where you'd just rather die than to work for the man anymore? How long are we going to work for that sorry little damn rascal? Why do we serve and give our lives over to Satan and live in his kingdom when he comes to steal and to kill and destroy and find, I mean, everything. When we're in his kingdom, we're under a curse. You're under a curse all the time. 
You can't keep Satan from cursing you if you're blown to him. If he's your master, he does with you whatever he wants to do with you and ain't nothing you can do about it. You have no recourse. You have no defense. He's stronger than we are. And when we belong to him, we're his servants, we're his slave. He can do anything he wants to. He can cause you to lose your job. He can cause you to get between, he can get between you and your wife and destroy your marriage. He can get in your life and cause cancer. He can cause trouble. He can cause sickness. He can cause disease. Why? Because you belong to him. Why did the Lord allow that to happen? The Lord didn't allow it to happen. We let it happen. Why did we allow it to happen? Because we're serving the wrong master. We're submitted unto Satan and him ruling and reigning over us. What we need to do is receive the stronger man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Listen to this. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. It ain't church going. It's not living up to codes. It's not doing all this religious stuff. The only thing you have to do is receive Jesus Christ and him dying on the cross for you not having to die and him shedding his blood to forgive us of our sin. And when we receive him in our heart, then his resurrection life lives on the inside. We have eternal life. It ain't all this mumbo jumbo religious crap of it stuff. That's all it is. He said, he that hath the Son, receive the Son, you got life. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. I don't care how much you go to church. You can move into the church. I did. Don't matter. It's not how many times. It's not what you do. He that hath the Son hath eternal life and shall not perish. Period. Period. But here come the church along adding all this stuff. Well, you can lose eternal life. Well, if I can lose eternal life, it wasn't eternal life. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> oh, my, I wish I had time to develop this. You know what God looks for? He don't look to see how you're handling everything and how good you live and how spotless and how much you do all this stuff. That's not what he's doing. You know what God looks for? He looks for one thing and one thing only. He looks for his son to see if his son is living in you. And if his son is living in you, then you're not your own. You belong to God. You have eternal life. Where you go to church and you don't go to church, you've got eternal life. When are we going to get this through our religious skulls? I know, mine's thick, but I, it's thinning out some. Over and over and over, he said, He that hath the Son, hath life. He that hath not the Son, don't have life. I don't care how good you live. You can keep all the Ten Commandments and add a, add a hundred to them. You still don't have an eternal life. Life does not come by keeping rules and regulation and religion and praying and reading the Bible. Life doesn't come by anything you can do. It comes by just eating the fruit of the tree of life and having his seed on the inside. I'm closing. First closing. How many do I get? For God so loved the world. This is the most awesome scripture in the whole Bible. We've heard it hundreds of times. But listen carefully. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. 
but have eternal life. That word perish there shall not be killed or destroyed now or throughout eternity. That's what perish is. If you receive Christ, you'll never be killed, you'll never be destroyed, and you'll never in this life or the life to come. Why? Because we got life living on the inside. Look up at your neighbor and say, he didn't send his son to condemn the world. Christians, we have degrees. I have a doctorate degree in condemning people. I was raised in church where they taught us to scrutinize everybody, pick out everything that's wrong, and condemn them for it. Because in condemning them, they'll realize how far slight they are and start living better. Tommy Rot, whatever that means. Jesus Christ did not come into the world to condemn us. But he came into the world that through him we might be saved from the fallen kingdom of Satan and be translated in the kingdom of his dear son. We can be born again. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God was God, who is a spirit, was inside of Christ reconciling the world back to himself. Now, how did he do that? How did he do that? Oh, he did that through Jesus. No. What does the scripture say? God, who is spirit, was inside of Jesus Christ, reconciling. What's the word reconciling mean? That means to bring two, like a marriage that has separated or divorced. One that reconciles is one that brings them back together and causes peace and harmony. God was in Christ causing peace and harmony from fallen mankind back to himself. How is he doing that? By not imputing their unrighteousness to their account. I wish that was preached in the churches today. How does he do it? He does not take your faults, your sins, your mistakes, your, your flaws, and impute that to you. He raises them out. He don't even hold a record of how good you're living and how bad you're living. That's the tree of knowledge of religion and God is not in it. Well, how in the world do you measure a Christian or non-Christian? Christ in you is your only hope of glory. Does Christ live in you? Paul said, examine yourself. Make sure your own self that Christ lives in you for a surety lest you be a reprobate. It ain't the one that believes in Jesus on some planet in outer space. It's not somebody that believes that Jesus came 2,000 years ago and died on the cross. He said, this is the spirit of life in 1 John. He that confesses now that Jesus Christ is come right now in the flesh, that's spirits of God. And any spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is not come right now in the flesh, that's antichrist. What in the world does that mean? That means if we confess that Jesus Christ lives in flesh, my flesh, your flesh, y'all's flesh, their flesh, them flesh. <laughs> if you say Christ lives in flesh right now, you know God you know the truth of the Spirit of God. Because Jesus Christ came to change us and to cleanse us, to cause us to be born children of God. Why? So that Him and the Father could come and live on the inside of you right now. Christians are waiting to get to heaven. Can't wait to see Jesus. You wouldn't know Him if you saw Him face to face because He lives right now in human beings and you don't see Him for the flesh. Well, boy, I'd be glad when we get to heaven so we can see Jesus. You wouldn't know him if you got there because he's right now and you don't see him. God was in Christ and the Jews never saw God inside of Jesus Christ. Veiled in flesh. Jesus, God is in Christ and now they come and live on the inside of us. Christ in me. Christ in you. 
And if you can't look past people's flesh and flaws and shortcomings and failures, you don't see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God in one another. Well, if we appear in heart, we're going to get to heaven and see God. God's a spirit you can't see with a natural eye. Amen. How many hours have I been preaching? I don't know, but it feels good to me. Life changing. Let me go real quick. Luke chapter 4. Let's find out what else Jesus came to do. He came to give us life, eternal life. He came to give us eternal life. Listen what else he did. Listen. I'm closing with this one. Promise. The Lord willing, of course. Always leave yourself a loophole, right? No, I'm through. Luke chapter 4. This is the Lord himself. This is the first message he got up and preached. Let me paraphrase the way church read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has sent me down here to let you know how sorry and low down you are. And if you don't get straight and quit this sinning, God's going to send you to hell. You're going to bust hell wide open. Praise God. <laughs> I've heard that before. Down to the altar I'd go because I didn't want to bust hell wide open. Three days time, I hadn't had a change. Ain't nothing different. Got up and I was trying to live right for three days. Hi, darling. <laughs> right back to the old thing. Hog will always go back to the water. But you take a sheep that God takes a hog like me, changes his nature, and make me one of his sheep, I don't like to wallow. Yeah. I do get muddy sometimes. I even fall in. Sometimes I go and wallow in it, but I don't really like to get muddy and dirty. I feel dirty when I get dirty and muddy. So therefore, that's the nature. Don't mean a sheep don't get muddy. Doesn't mean a sheep don't get dirty. But there's just something on the inside just don't want to stay that way. Got to go to the Father and tell him, Lord, Wash me with the washing of the water of the word. Cleanse me from all that stuff, God. That was me. I messed up. I did it deliberately, God, but I feel so dirty inside. Lord, cleanse me. He's faithful and just to forgive us. But listen to what else he says. Luke chapter 4, this is his first message. Listen to the difference between what I say the preachers, all of us preachers used to preach and what some of them still preach versus what Jesus preached. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, which is the good news, to harrow or to proclaim good news. That's what God's anointed Jesus for. That's what he's anointed me for. I'm here today anointed to preach and to harrow good news to you. What is that good news? To preach the good news to the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit that don't feel like they're some something. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted. Jesus came to heal the broken hearted. You look up that word broken hearted. It's spirits that are depressed or crushed by grief and despair. Listen to what Jesus himself said. I came to heal those whose spirit is depressed. Who have they been, they have been beaten down. They've been hurt. I came and I know why you're there. I know why you're going through what you're going through. I came to heal that broken heart. I didn't say that. Jesus did. Spirits, that's, your spirit that's been crushed and grief and despair of life. I came to heal that, Jesus said. To preach deliverance to the captives. That word captives right there are those that have been taken captive in warfare. Become prisoners of war. Satan 
has come and took humanity and all men and women, every one of us, and brought us into his captivity. And he has been a slave driver for thousands of years. Jesus said, I came to set you free from that rascal. Set the captives free. To recover the sight to the blind. That's not just natural blindness. That's spiritual blindness. Jesus said, if you have spiritual ears to hear, let your ears hear what the Spirit is speaking to your heart, not your head. These ears hear words that go to my brain. But when God speaks, I hear his words and it goes to my heart. That's the difference in spiritual ears and natural ears. Natural eyes and spiritual eyes. When the minister is ministering or when Jesus was telling parables, you literally could picture what he was saying. Seeing it through the spiritual eyes. Recover to sight to the blind. And set at liberty them that are bruised. That word bruised is crushed, hurt, broken by a blunt and a heavy object. Let me say that again. Jesus came to heal that which is bruised. 